Now, thank you so much for joining us for this special coverage of the 26th edition of the World Economic Forum taking place right here in Rwanda for the very first time, but of course the second in Africa. I'm now joined in the studio right here by none other than the CEO of BRD Commercial, part of Atlas Mara, Konde Bugjingo. Thank you so much for joining us on set. Very quickly, it is important to understand the place of technology in the banking sector because there are those who are already saying that the banking sector is at a very tough time, of course a crossroad, because there are those who are saying that if the banking sector does not adapt to the current changes that are taking place in terms of technology and being innovative, then they are bound to be overtaken by other financial service operators. What is your quick thought on that? Do you agree with that? Do you feel that this is not the correct perception? I think banking has gone through an evolution and digital uh, programs or digital uh, evolution of what we've been doing, whether in banking, in telco or in any other industry, is the way forward. There is no question that it's not only going to affect banking, but it's going to affect across all sectors. Even today, um, if you consider that Rwanda will be one of the only countries you can actually deliver medical services using a, a drone, that's digital for you. So when it comes to banking, it's so important even more than any other industry. Banking is about creating products and services efficiently and less risky. And there's no better way to do that uh, by using digital. And the second thing is banking is also about accessing finance uh, from our clients and potential clients through deposits for mobilizing savings that we lend out. And also banking is facilitating those transactions uh, easier, efficiently, effectively and controlled. So nothing comes better than digitalization to ensure that those things happen. So partnering with uh, digital partners is very important. Be telcos, payment schemes, payment companies, it is so important that you are in the fintech space. And you know, it is, I'm proud to sit here and say even today when we launched our application, uh, basically our bank app is to ensure that we are entering that space with very uh, strong vigor, firm, and we're able to deliver for our clients. Going digital is the way forward. Right. Now, talking about the issue of uh, the competition as far as you know, other financing institutions or applications or other platforms are concerned, uh, we understand that the mobile banking business had sort of uh, you know, uh, poked uh, holes on the traditional way of how banks were operating. Today, we see a lot of partnerships with uh, you know, mobile banking services and applications being created along the same line. Could this be a proof of that statement of if you cannot beat them, join them? I think in whatever industry you're in, competition is always going to be there. But also, if you are standing out and you, if you are cut out for that industry and you're prepared, then it, you will not have to do that choice. You will not have to make a choice between whether it's join them or leave it or, uh, it, you know, it comes down to preparedness. It comes down to understanding the industry. I believe that if you're prepared enough and you've been evolving with the times, you will know exactly where you're heading. If you're headed the direction where you're copying everybody else, then your returns will remain stable, your returns will remain um, uh, plateau. There will be no change, no spikes. But probably over time, your returns start to go down because you definitely will lose clients, definitely will lose that momentum in terms of creating transactions you will lose so many elements within the business as well as the fact that you then start losing even the transaction of fees and commissions within the banking sector, let me say. Or if you go into telco, it's the same thing. So it is important that you evolve with it. You're dynamic enough and evolving with the trend of, of mobile banking, but becoming even more innovative to go further. I think in the coming few months and, and, and years ahead, you're going to see a different BPR that has, you know, br br you know, that is bringing innovative products on the market that is nowhere near copying what it is, uh, what it is in the market. If you recall, six years ago, I was sitting in the same stage, uh, launching BPR's mobile banking on a feature phone, not a smartphone. Now, we have now evolved. It's taken a bit longer, but we've evolved. We, we're rebranding today as well as showing that modern digital services that we had started. The first time in Rwanda was launched by BPR. 
six years ago. And now we're launching today the first of its kind in Rwanda again, a mobile app that will serve that market. Now it shows that we are evolving. So in that industry, and as you put your question, you have to evolve with the market. Otherwise, you're left behind. Right. You have to evolve the market. Now, let's talk about the issue of integration because we've had speaker after speaker at this forum talking about the importance of now talking as a regional block, talking as a block as opposed to, you know, talking about country, individual country, individual, uh, you know, markets within our own countries. But we haven't had a lot when it comes to banks speaking one voice when it comes to integration. How do we do this? Is it even possible? Is it even viable? Absolutely. I think it is also very clear guidance from the National Bank that we have several meetings that have taken place for the last few years, uh, as a banker I've been involved, that we have several uh, initiatives from the ministries, uh, from uh, the National Bank and several other partners that have, we've been working together to ensure that we can actually interoperate as a region. So there is a process between ensuring that the transfers or banking transactions that we are carrying out today are actually going through one particular payment platform or one particular clearing platform to ensure that fees are reduced, the ease of doing business is aided. There are several initiatives that are happening. So there is a voice, there is a combined voice, a conjoined voice of all the banks and all other partners within the financial sector through the government institutions that we have with a clear mandate and policy to ensure that we can uh, you know, take the, the opportunity of the region. Right, now in, in closing, the future of the banking sector, when we look at the fourth industrial, industrial revolution, which we all understand is already here with us, how do we ensure that uh, we tackle uh, the, the, the challenges that come along with this uh, evolution, with this new change? Some of those challenges that have been pointed out already include cybercrime. Some of them include hacking and, and security issues when it comes to transacting online. How do we ensure that we deal with those issues and in the end, enjoy the fruits of this revolution. Let me start by two examples. Mobile money and Bitcoin. When mobile money came, it, took, it, it happened so fast that, for example, uh, in some of the countries, they were not able to build policy and controls around it. They actually built policy when the, when, when the transaction was already in place and the business was already in place. Mm -hmm. That is the number one challenge. Mm -hmm. Another example is Bitcoin. Today, we all know that Bitcoin, the way it operates, is quite innovative. It's way ahead of our time almost. But the regulations that go around it to ensure that it works within the limits that for guard and, 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 and ensure that people's funds are kept safe and assets are kept safe, today, there's still a challenge. So in, in my view, it's around ensuring that this transformation, this industrialization uh, phase that we're in, is kept intact. We need, we need several things to happen. Uh, in my opinion, we need policy, that is on the level of regulators, government. We need clear guidance on policy. We need people who can look far ahead, in, in the sense that you can actually get people who are in, a, in the innovative space to start advising the policymakers on what will happen two, three, down, three years down the line, so that we can actually build these policies in place and evolve and implement them as we begin these phases. You pointed out that there is a risk on, uh, there are risks, especially safety, uh, security, uh, cyber crimes, and so on. Those things, if we don't take, take time now to ensure that we can foreguard them, then we'll be in the same loop. They will happen, we will run through, and we will lose some things, and then all of a sudden somebody will come up with a policy and, and security measures. So we need to use some of these innovative young people who are actually ahead of the game to start helping the policymakers to come up with some uh, strong measures. Then the second thing is to actually also ensure that within this innovative space that we're in, the people who are within the innovative space who are ahead of the game and are coming up with really innovative solutions, they need to be brought into the space of ensuring that they are given incentives to build these innovative solutions with a safety mechanism, with security intact, with controls, with aims to ensure that there's, there's risk and reward balance, rather than it's all making sure that I can make the quick buck as much as I could. Just what has happened in the last five years. So there is need to balance those two. 
Uh, and I believe some of the policymakers that, and, and, the, and the leaders that we have will definitely come to some, something like that. Right. In your statement, it seems that these are not, or these things are not already happening. Does it concern you that we still haven't involved these experts in these technological issues in, you know, advising on form, policy formulation and, 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 and those things that you mentioned that we still need to do? Does it concern you that we haven't, you know, taken a bigger step in doing them, in implementing them? To some extent, it does. To some extent it does, but that is on the, level of, um, on the level of the way I see the trend going. However, on the level of a bank, like Bank Populaire, BPR will go into areas we have absolutely done research, we have looked around the world, we have international uh, best practices in place, we have tested and tried, we've ensured that security mechanisms are in place, and we are serving our clients in, 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 in this, the most secure way possible. Uh, and that at least we can promise to our clients, uh, especially on the digitalization side. Uh, whereas on the other side, in terms of the other services that we offer, they are more standard, they are more basic. Uh, we have evolved and securities are way embedded in the systems that we operate. But when it comes to the outside world, the areas where we've not gone, uh, the areas where we've not tested, then there is some concern. And I think it needs to be addressed. It needs to be addressed as soon as possible. In closing, three common mistakes you feel the banking sector, not just in Rwanda, but in the region, uh, uh, you know, is doing to keep away some other people who are not banked or, you know, not in the system. What are those three things that you feel uh, need to be corrected? The common mistakes that we see around here, in your own opinion? I think the, um, I would term them as not mistakes but the result of pressure of what you have to let deliver. As a bank, there are several key things you have to deliver, targets for you, uh, for your shareholders. Uh, and those returns have to be met. Now, w in the pursuit of those returns, there are measures or uh, tariffs and approaches that banks take that maybe clients might feel that they are mistakes or might feel that they are being, you know, uh, uh, you know, it, it's taking them in the wrong direction and it's being harsh on them, but it's the pursuit of those returns. Now, there are challenges we are facing at banks. We, uh, we are facing uh, FX challenges. We're facing mobilization of savings uh, is, is quite low. Uh, and also the, the FDI uh, type of investments that we would like to come into the countries to prop up not only FX, but also prop up uh, the, the fund base that we have is, is growing, and we really appreciate the support that is coming through, but it's still, it's, you know, it's still at a base where we can actually not be able to reduce our tariffs, for example. And that's one of the things that everybody touches upon, that pricing is too high, which people believe that banks are making mistakes by charging too high, so then people are not able to join the banking sector. But it's those pressures that if you don't borrow funds from abroad, and if you don't mobilize enough savings from the local market, then you're not able to reduce your price because the, the funds from abroad are quite expensive. And the local currency uh, fund mobilization is still low. So you end up charging a high price to feed and, 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 and pay for your costs of, of borrowing money. Now, that might be seen as a mistake, but actually that is the mechanism. Now, on the FX side, that is the challenge that is, we are facing, and we, we are not able to serve our clients properly because there's basically an FX challenge on, on, on especially the hard currencies, uh, and it's a cross. But, of course, as banks, at least one thing I could point out, I think we can improve on the way we bring the rest of the economy in from the rural sector, informal sector, to maybe advise them accordingly to build businesses that can actually then become exporters. That is where I see that we can actually play a role. Now, again, because of the other elements of what your pressures are, you end up sidetracking where you could actually focus and build a base of clients who can actually export, and then you deal with those challenges. So that is some of the challenges we made. And, 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 um, but again, you know, if, if banks made too many mistakes, then there would be a big problem. So there are less mistakes. There is only pressures 
that lead you to making certain decisions that might seem not um, uh, conducive to the it. Right, like the pressure of, of, of the borrowing, uh, uh, the, the, the cost of borrowing. Uh, some people would argue and say, listen, the, the central banks uh, are giving you, uh, you know, uh, the, the money at, at a low interest rate. Why would you then hike uh, the interest rate for those who are borrowing? Does that uh, argument hold any water? I think central banks lend money to banks and the private sector in line with monetary policy. Now, the moni monetary policy manages the rate at which they, rate, they, they, they lend, but also it manages the, um, the volumes. Now, the volumes as well as the value. Now, when you look at across the region, the level of uh, intervention from the government institutions to lend money to the private sector, especially banks, could not serve um, the sector, not uh, possible to serve the sector. It supports the sector, and then, of course, the, the, the regulators will then also entice other private sector uh, players, such as RSSB, to also, you know, pension funds, to also bring in funds into this banking sector and lend to the banks. But what we're trying to say is that those rates are not far away from the rate that we can go out, borrow funds, then swap the funds which are dollar with the regulator to get local currency so that you're able to pay back at some point in 10 years. When you work out all those rates, you come to the same rates. So you end up with basically the same base rate. That becomes your base rate. Um, and the base rate, that is what I mean by base rate, I mean internally. You cannot lend at anything lower than that which in most cases in this country is between 10 and 11. So if you cannot lend below that, and yet you've not factored in operational costs, you've not factored in risk, uh, if you factor those in, then that's how we end up at least in Rwanda, which is one of the countries that are doing absolutely fantastically, is that we will lend at around 16%. BPR, BRD Commercial Bank as part of BPR, we lend first-time buyers of mortgages uh, at about 16%. That is, more, that is lower than any other part of this region, but also lower than any other bank in this market. But that gives you a sense that we, only, we have a spread of 5%. There, we are actually operating at a level of almost supporting the social development and the social fabric of the country than actually making profit. And, and it, it is exemplary in the recent FinScop survey from the National Bank that the returns of banks in Rwanda is still slightly lower than the whole region because the region's interest rates are very high. Would this change the status quo? Would this you know, lead you to change if, if the returns are lower uh, based because of the lending rate being lower? Would, would this change the status quo? Of course, because it's putting pressure on the returns. You have, to, you have to give back to your shareholders. Just like our shareholders for us as BPR are 600,000 Rwandese. Uh, that would like to see some return, not far away from now. Uh, it's been a long time, but the way we're building the bank today, we're going to have to bring some returns that make sense to them and start being competitive on returns, especially also the fact that, you know, we have Atlas Mara, that is a listed company on the, on the, on the London Stock Exchange. The shareholders, our, our shareholders, will have to see some returns. So the interest rates will have to evolve according to how we need to make sure that we can deliver those returns. Good enough is the fact that BPR is in position of employing technology to ensure that we reduce the cost of operation. We reduce the cost of operation, we reduce the cost of serving our clients, so then that rate comes down and we're able to compete better than other banks. So we might not have as much pressure as other banks because of the fact that we've put you know, uh, low, cost capital, low, low cost capital on, on, our, on, on our balance sheet. We also have technology that will aid us to actually serve our clients much better. Mm -hmm. And that technology is what worries some people. When you say that we're going to reduce our cost of operation uh, as we replace that with, with, with the use of technology, and that translates sometimes in the cutting of jobs in, in certain situations. And that has been the worry of many people when it comes to the fourth industrial uh, revolution. Uh, so how do we ensure that those in employment do not have that fear that this technology is going to take over my job and so soon and very soon I may be jobless. I think it, is, it has been the norm and everybody says the same thing. But the way we believe is that today the cost is high because people are spending uh, most of their time serving clients manually, serving clients, yes, with systems, but 
operationally having to physically pass on the transaction, do the document, mm -hmm. fill out the document, take it for clearing, and so on. Mm -hmm. Simple transactions. Mm -hmm. What we are saying is these transactions can all be automated, but that person does not need to lose their job, mm -hmm. the person on the other end. They now need to sell more. They now need to go out, upscale their skills, okay? We will do that mm -hmm. as BPR. We will upscale us, uh, the skills of our staff to ensure that they can now go out there and become the salespeople. They can serve our clients on other products. Mm -hmm. So when you have so many people serving on transactions and, and the documents, you have less people selling the product. Mm -hmm. So we can now have these people actually go out there and sell more. To the extent that we, we believe that we can even, the more and more you automate, it gives you also an opportunity to uh, modernize your services. It also gives you an opportunity to, get, to upscale the skills of your staff as well as making them entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. The sum of our staff that will, could decide to become entrepreneurs because they see they can actually provide services that the bank is actually doing in-house mm -hmm. on a private relationship. And we continue to give them business. And we not only give them business from a banking sector, but we also lend to them to be able to do the business they like to do. So there are several ways that we can actually do this, but also as we expand, as we grow, it means that we are going to also introduce more products, more services, and these services will need part of our current uh, staff to be trained in those new roles to then start serving another market by diversifying our, in our income. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Conde, for your time. Thank you. Right, thank you so much for joining us on this very special edition and coverage of the 26th edition of the World Economic Forum happening right here in Rwanda. Stay tuned for more interviews such as this one and even better right here. Do stay with us.